chief uh, account on malignant tumors and uh, so starting with fibrous dysplasia it's a mosaic bone disease it can involve any part or combination of craniofacial axillary or ventricular skeleton bones affected by this disorder are usually replaced by abnormal fibrous tissue which weakens the bone making it abnormally fragile and prone to fracture pain may occur in affected areas and as children grow affected bones may become misshapen or dysplastic fibrous dysplasia can occur as part of a larger disorder such as acute albright syndrome this is fibrous dysplasia along with cafeol spots and endocrine dysfunctions and mesobroad syndrome which is fibrous dysplasia along with myxomas the two common types monoostrotic and the polyostrotic the monoostrotic is commonest but it's uh, usually diagnosed in later forms because of the uh, lack of symptoms or deformity the polyostrotic is usually severe and is discovered early Fibrous dysplasia affects males and females equally, and the exact incidence and prevalence of disorder is unknown. This is a picture showing typical boying of fibrous dysplasia. As a syndrome, it can appear in a child with uh, multiple cafeol spots involving of the cranium, involving of the limbs, part of the brain, and uh, uh the appendicular skeleton these are typical cafeol spots as seen in mckeown uh albright syndrome and uh, typically appearing on the back lower back and uh, they can also appear uh, as multifocal uh, fibrous dysplasia they have a typical ground glass appearance of the bone with multiple cystic deformities In the femur, it's uh, very well known to form a shepherd's crook, uh, shaped like a shepherd's crook, and uh, the shaft of the femur is usually bored down by multiple cysts, and they usually fracture and repair and heal up in a deformed bone. This can also present as intramedullary lesions and uh, ring-like sclerosis of bone at periphery. So this is typical appearance in the humerus. In this area, in this uh, X-ray, you can see a large lytic lesion in the calcaneum, which with sclerotic margins, and this was also a typical presentation of fibrous dysplasia. Again, in polyostrotic forms, you can see multiple cysts in the humerus and in the tibia. As I told you before, the X-rays show a typical ground glass appearance, expansion of the involved area of the bone, and abnormal curvature of the bone. So, if you see closely, you will see cystic areas. Ground glass appearance of the bone. At times, you will see soap bubble-like appearance on X-rays, which is more visible on CT scans. This is a pathological fracture uh, in the cyst. Fibrous dysplasia. As I told you before, the CT scan depicts more of the ground glass appearance. The MRI will show you multiple cystic areas with fluid, fluid filled contents. And uh, in as a syndrome, if we do the bone scan, we usually identify and determine the extent of bone lesions and sh should be performed in all patients suspected to have fibrous dysplasia. Histologically, they appear uh, as irregular Chinese like uh, Chinese character like appearance of the trabeculae. And uh, this is how you can see the lack of uh, uh, bony, uh, bony uh, cells and there is all fibrous tissue.
Treatment is usually these uh, pyrus dysplasia, if it's uh, monoostrotic, it can be treated conservatively, but if it's polyostrotic, it is usually treated, treated by a team of specialists like the geographicians, internists, orthopedic surgeons, endocrinologists, and other healthcare professions. And the psychological support of the entire family is also essential, usually it runs in families. The specific therapeutic procedure and interventions may also depend on the factors such as disease progression, size of the lesion, the presence or absence of symptoms, the age and the health of the patient. So usually they are asymptomatic, so they are just we seen as follow up in six months to one year and to see any progress in the lesions. Bisphosphonates like pamidronate and alendronate are also very useful as anti-resorptive drugs and uh, along with calcium and vitamin D3 they can prevent uh, pathological fractures and uh, if the uh, treatment fails or if there is recurrence or relapse then zolendronic acid is usually given and uh, helps in control of pain and uh, bone healing. Surgery is usually limited to uh, patients who are sh showing signs of deformities or if it's involving the spine uh, scoliosis or if there are lesions which are compressing the nerve or causing pain, then and only then surgery is required. So usually it's treated conservatively. This is a typical proximal lesion of the tibia. It was fixed by a plate and graft and shows healing. Again the shepherd stroke deformity, this was treated with multiple osteotomies and uh, with a telescoping growing rock, retrograde intermediate veneal. Okay, the last tumor that I am going to discuss is the brown tumor, usually as a sequelae of hyperparathyroidism also known as osteitis fibrosa cystica. Histologically, it's identical to giant cell tumor or osteoclastoma. This is how it typically it appears, as a lytic lesion, and uh, it may be misdiagnosed because uh, for such patients, if we do the blood cal calcium level or the parathyroid level, then and then we can diagnose this problem. Otherwise, you can make, uh, we can uh, confuse it with other primary bone tumors. So it's basically a reparative cellular process rather than a neoplastic process. So as a sequelae of hyperparathyroidism, the treatment is usually for the lesion, uh, uh, for the hyperparathyroidism. This is again a lesion seen in the just proximal tibia, expansile lytic lesion, but there is no cortical breach. Again, the same lesion, the proximal tibia. Okay, this is a patient involving the all of the skeleton showing areas of lytic areas in the uh, in the in the ribs, in the vertebrae, and a rugged jersey appearance of the spinal the spinal bodies. This is typical seen typically seen in hyperparathyroidism. Uh, for diagnosing this condition, we usually do a systemic scan for the parathyroid genoma and uh, in addition to plain uh, films, CT and MRI should be performed to help differentiate from other tumors, which should be considered even in context of hyperparathyroidism. So as I told you before, uh, the treatment of hyperthyroid, hyperparathyroidism will lead to healing up of these lesions. There is usually parathyroidectomy done and uh, it is uh, usually uh, accompanied with calcitrol as a pharmacological agent. Give you a quick review of all the tumors that we have discussed so that we don't uh, 
uh, have to review them again and again. Starting with osteoastroma. Remember, it's an osteoblastic mass. It's a bone growing tumor, bone growing tumor, and usually seen in the second decade. Usually, proximal tumor, tibia, spinal involved. It's a, it causing a dull pain. Usually, it's worse at night. It's relieved by NSAIDs and not related to position or function. This is a typical appearance of osteoastroma. The next lesion is the bigger one, is the osteo osteoblastoma. Usually, if it's bigger than 2 centimeters, then it's an osteoblastoma. It has got all the features of osteoastroma, but usually it's seen in the vertebral column, and uh, it has got a potential of malignancy, and uh, because of the size, it can lead to pathological fractures. The third one we discussed was the non-ossifying fibroma. It's a fibrous cortical defect in the bone, and it is one of the commonest, one of the common musculoskeletal tumor usually seen in the first two decades. The long bones, typically the femur, tibia, and humerus, are involved, and radiologically we'll see a well-defined eccentric radiolucent lesion in the metaphysis and. Uh, it, it won't show any signs of expansion of the cortex and there will be no periosteal reaction. Treatment is usually observation and follow-up until the patient is symptomatic or uh, the, if there is any sudden growth in the tumor. The next one, the most common is bone tumor, is osteochondroma. It's a developmental anomaly rather than a tumor. Usually it is sporadic and can, it can be a part of hereditary multiple exostosis. Uh, it can be of two varieties, it can be sessile or pedunculated and is seen in the metaphysical region uh, and projected away from the epiphysis. Risk of malignant transformation is 1% in solitary and 5% in hereditary multiple exostosis. The next common thing we discussed was enchondroma. It's a cartilage tumor, cartilage forming tumor, uh, usually found in children and adults, may lead to pathological fractures or may undergo malignant degeneration. 3 to 10% of all bone tumors uh, are enchondroma, and it's around 12 to 24% of all benign tumors. Most frequently they are diagnosed in adult hurt, usually between the first and third decade. It can uh, lead to uh, complications like pathological fracture, malignant transformation, and uh, if the enchondroma is painful in the absence of fracture, it should be it should be considered malignant. This is typically how you can see uh, enchondroma is a typical picture of oleous disease, is multiple enchondromatosis. The other tumor, or rather rare benign tumor, also known as Cordman's tumor, is the chondroblastoma. Usually involves the uh, in, in the first uh, two decades of life, and this is only compromises is of one percent of all the primary one tumors. Pathologically, it comprises of chondroblasts, cartilage-like cells, and multinucleated giant cells. It can be, it has to be uh, uh, seen earlier because it can hamper the growth and uh, it can lead to aneurysmal bones and uh, may present as synovitis of the knee nerve. The one of the tumor like conditions is, uh, as we see, is the unicameral bone cyst. It's a development anomaly of the on physis and the transient of failure of ossification of physial cartilage and cyst formation. It usually resolves spontaneously and in later adulthood and rarely it persists into adulthood. The usual sites are proximal humerus, proximal femur, and calcaneum. Uh, active cysts are just exposed to physis. Usually, as I told you before, they are asymptomatic, but can be noticed after pathological fractures. The next tumor we discussed was uh, an urethral bone cyst. It is a benign expensile lesion, usually again in the second decade of life. These are basically blood-filled 
places uh, in the tumor separated by connective tissue and uh, they are osteoid tissue along with osteoclastic giant cells. Usually there are two types, primary and secondary. Secondary can be after uh, chondroblastoma, parvis dysplasia, giant cell tumor and osteosarcoma. Giant cell tumor again is a locally aggressive tumor. It basically arises from non-bone forming uh, elements of the bone and the tissue, uh, 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 connective tissue of the bone with network of stromal cells regularly interspersed with giant cells. Uh, usually it uh, happens after the closure of growth plate. So they appear in after the second decade, can go up to the third, fourth decade. They are locally aggressive and show significant bone destruction, local recurrence, and occasionally mets. It's more common in females in threes to one, and uh, if it's in females, it's they are they usually can convert to malignant. Just a small mnemonic that we help remember for the postgraduates that remember the E of GCT, it's epiphyseal, eccentric, expensile, Extended curatage is the treatment and uh, excision if excision of the whole region if the extended curatage fails. So just a small mnemonic. This was all about uh, benign tumors. At the end of this uh, uh, talk, I'll uh, have a small quiz. I'll show you a few X-rays and I'm going to tell you what they are. So. My next talk will be on malignant tumors. Uh, uh, so, so before uh, starting the next talk, we will I will just give you a brief uh, account on the malignant bone tumors. So, talking about primary malignant bone tumors are incredibly rare, or we can call it very uncommon. The initial symptoms and signs can be vague and non-specific. Often the patient may wait for for a long period or months hoping that the problem would settle on its own or with some remedy at home. The foundation of optimal outcome in the treatment of any malignant disease is early detection and correct diagnosis. The most common benign tumors, uh, 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 primary bone tumors, malignant ones are the osteogenic sarcoma, the Ewing sarcoma and the chondrosarcoma. So we should look at the sites where we can find them. Usually they are seen in the vertebrae, the pelvis, the humerus, femur, usually the proximal areas and uh, 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 around the knee and elbow. They spread usually via blood streams. They occasionally can be uh, spread directly with invasion and very rarely through lymphatics or osteolytic lesions. So what are the main sources of bone tumors? They can arise from prostate, breast, lungs, renal, adrenal, and thyroid. Mets are usually rare in children, but they can be seen in neuroblastomas, rhabdomas, sarcomas, and clear cell carcinoma of kidney. So management of malignant tumors needs a multidisciplinary, multi-professional team involving an orthopedic surgeon, a radiologist, a pathologist, oncologist, physiotherapist, occupational therapist, prosthetist, and rehabilitation nurses, even involving the psychiatrists. So it's uh, basically you're dealing with a whole patient rather than just a tumor. So the important thing about uh, malignant tumors is the history. So usually you'll see Ewing sarcoma in less than 10 years of age, osteogenic sarcoma in the second, third, or fourth decade, chondro or fibrosarcoma after the fourth decade, multiple myeloma in the sixth decade. In patients over 70 years of age, metastatic bone lesions are more common than primary tumors. Diagnosis, sex is usually not the uh, uh, differentiating part, but osteosarcoma is more common in males and giant cell tumor is more common in females. And uh, even sarcoma is rare in African descent. And uh, if you have, there is a family history of multiple hereditary exostosis or neurofibromas, then again we can uh, uh, have a clue of diagnosis. 
Continuing with it, the most important symptom that they give is pain, usually at rest or at night. Pain may be due to expansion of the lesion, due to central hemorrhage, or there is sudden growth and tumor gener de degeneration, or if there is incipient pathological factor. The next symptom we uh, see is swelling, usually a, a, a swelling which is increasing in size and progression in a shorter time. Then there will be symptoms like anorexia, weight loss, fever, and then can be neurological symptoms. If the tumor is pressing on some nerves, so the patient can experience paresthesia and numbness. And usually, if you see that these patients in emergency, they can be uh, they can come to us with a trivial trauma and with pathological fractures. So, as I told you, history has got a very important role. After history, we do an examination. As a whole, we see the patients are usually anemic, dehydrated, wasted, or because of their appearance can be jaundiced. The lymph node metastasis are usually rare in these patients. An examination, you won't encounter lymph nodes. Uh, but they are seen in synovial cell sarcoma, retromass sarcomas, and epithelioid sarcomas. So once you've seen the swelling in a malignant tumor, you will see the size, the size, the consistency, the mobility, the tenderness, the neurological deficit, and the joint stiffness, which is uh, involving the bone, which is involved. Then we examine the chest, abdomen, rectum, spine. As I told you, all, all the systems where, from where we suspect the tumor is coming. So, a brief preview. As I told you, we call the three um, primary malignant bone tumors we are going to discuss will be a Ewing sarcoma, which is usually seen in children, involves the diaphysis of the long bones. Onion skin appearance is usually seen on the x rays. Treatment is usually surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. And the five-year survival rate is around 70%. The other tumor we encounter, we will we we'll discuss, and we usually encounter is osteogenic sarcoma. It can be primary in adolescent and secondary in elderly people. It usually involves the metastasis. The typical appearance in the X-rays are sunburst appearance, garments triangles, or moth eaten appearance. Usual treatment is surgery, polychemotherapy, and with the new adjuvant therapy, the survival rate is now up to 70%. The third tumor we want to discuss will be the, uh, the chondrosarcoma, usually seen in the adults after the fourth or fifth decade. Usually involves the pelvis, ribs, proximal, femur, and humerus. Uh, there will be multitude appearance on x-rays, endosteal scalloping, intralesional calcifications. Usually they are chemoradioresistant and uh, so surgery is the treatment of choice and uh, recurrence of the five-year survival rate can be 60% depending on the site and size of the lesion. Investigation, the gold standard is x-rays. You should always see, look at the x-rays and see the cortical thickening, the uh, destruction of the bone, the location, metaphysis or diaphysis, the margins, which are the ill-defined or well-defined. Then the periosteal reaction, is it sunburst, is it, cord is it cordman triangle, the soft tissue mass around the tumor, as we see here, the sunburst, moth eaten appearance. Then if we see calcifications, usually they are seen in the uh, cartilage tumors like the chondrosarcoma, you will see annular, punctate, popcorn, or comma shaped. Then they can be cortical thickening and osteal scalloping as seen in chondrosarcoma. So this is what I discussed before, the onion skinning and uh, the destruction of the bone. This is how plain radiographs can be helpful. Uh, patients with multiple myeloma, adamantinoma, one of the hardest bone tumors, and uh, multiple then fibrous histiocytoma. <clears throat> the destructive lesions, again, as I told you, 
we can see uh, in all the leashes, geographic, multi-eaten, permeative, and distinct borders are seen. Soft tissue lesion is there or not, if the lesion is plastic or lytic, and uh, if it's a primary or a bone uh, or a bone metastasis. So, so X-ray has got a big role in diagnosing of these tumors. Annie Kings has given us uh, uh, staging to uh, read the tumors, and if we are staging is as 1A, 1B. If it's 1A, it's a low-growing tumor, intercompartmental. If it's 1B, it's low-growing tumor, extra-compartmental. 2A is higher-grade tumor, which is intercompartmental. 2B is again high-grade but extra-compartmental. 3A is any grade with regional or distal metastasis, and they are usually intercompartmental. And 3B, any grade of tumor with regional or distal metastasis, and which are extra-compartmental. So before proceeding, the patient should have an informed consent uh, as to what option he is uh, uh, opting for. Is he going for a limb salvage surgery or life-saving surgery or if he doesn't want any treatment or if he wants treatment. So it is tailored to every patient. So every patient has got a different disease, so it needs a different treatment. So you need to have an informed consent. Then we should tell him about the natural history of the disease, the various treatment options, limb salvage, amputation, adjuvant therapy, and the pros and cons of treatment. As I told you before, osteosarcoma usually respond to neoadjuvant chemotherapy along with surgery. Chondrosarcomas usually don't respond to chemo radio and Surgery, surgical treatment is the choice. Multiple myeloma is usually uh, 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 hematological tumor, so surgery is usually restricted to pathological fractures or spinal decompression, otherwise it's treated on hemoradio. Then uh, surgery, solitary bone lesions in previous history of malignancy, so you should not be assumed as a metastatic lesion, it can be again a primary lesion. Surgical treatment of usually metabolic, metastatic bone disease is palliative. And for epiphyseal and metaphyseal lesions, it's best to replace the joint uh, after excision of the complete tumor. So usually diaphyseal tube lesions are treated with intermedial nails. If it's they are around the joint, like in shoulder or in hip, we can uh, treat them with arthroplasties. So then there is a, a concern about the surgical resection. So we have intralesional resections or ex excision, marginal excision, wide local excision, and radical excision. So for one A lesions, as I told you, according to anything, we employ wide excision. For two A, we give them wide excision with adjuvant or new adjuvant therapy. For 2B, it's a radical excision along with adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. For stage 3, they are usually treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, radical resection, and uh, followed by uh, again uh, chemo or radiotherapy. Amputation, although uh, a disfiguring thing, but usually the indications are when the tumor is presented late. If there is significant neurovascular damage, the extremity function is poor and uh, there are failed attempts of salvage of the limb. If there is pathological fracture, if the biopsy is performed is done poorly and there are areas of multiple involvement, if there is persistent local recurrence. So uh, if, if definite surgical treatment or limb available, the uh, limb sparing is not available. So amputation is the answer for all these problems. Chemotherapy it was introduced in 1970s, and uh, the advantages are that it reduces the size of lesion, prevents metastatic seedings, allows easy resectability, and improves improves chances of survival. Drugs usually used are methotrexate, doxorubicin, cyclophosphamide, vincristine, cisplatin, and etoposide. Uh, 
Uh, radiotherapy is poorly effective. It is a, as used as a part of new adjuvant therapy. It does decrease the vascularity in pre-op patients and uh, it clears the microscopic margins and tumor site. If it's not accessible to surgery, it can be treated with the radiotherapy. And it does relieve in symptoms of pain and bleeding. So, if talking about metastatic or secondary malignant diseases, the aim is palliation of the uh, disease. The goals, uh, what are the goals of fixation? So, the patient should be fixed with a nail or uh, or arthroplasty so that he is immediately made pain free. And uh, uh, we usually do it to protect the entire bone. Usually, intramedullary nails are used, uh, or a hemi, a hemi arthroplasty or hip replacements are done for hip involvement. These are a few examples. Uh, the Harrington's criteria for prophylactic fixation. If there is more than 50% destruction of diaphysis, then we go for prophylactic fixation. And if the, there is 50 to 75% destruction of metaphysis, then we go for again fixation. If it's a permeative lesion and uh, it's seen in high stress areas, then again we can go for prophylactic fixation. And if the patient has gone through irradiation and is complaining of persistent pain, then again we can go for prophylactic fixation. The other thing is the Merrill's criteria. It gives you a score and if the score is greater than 8, then we suggest, uh, then we suggest uh, prophylactic fixation. So just an example, if it's the upper limb, we give one score. If it's mild pain, if it's plastic, then the score comes to 3. So we can leave it alone. But if it's a peritrochanter fracture, it's functionally uh, compromising and it's a lytic lesion. So, so 3, 3, 3 will be 9. So if it, this score is greater than 8, we need uh, to fix them prophylactically. Bisphosphonates also add to the treatment and uh, they are highly effective uh, um, inhibitors of bone resorption, pamidronate, zoledronic acid are usually given. Uh, and uh, prevents bone mats in operable breast cancers. Then these patients should be followed for local recurrences or mats. Again, the tumor is physically examined, the, all the investigations are done, and uh, uh, all the workup is done, and then we weigh as to what to do next, to either to leave the patient or to do any reconstruction. Prognosis depends on the metastasis, the size of the lesion, the grade, the location, the response to chemo and surgical resection, uh, the most important being the age of the patient. So as a conclusion, the surgical management of malignant bone tumors presents many challenges. With advances in chemo and radiotherapy, neurodermal therapy, most patients can now be offered limb spanning surgery. Amputation still plays an important role and offers a standard to which other approaches must be compared. Okay, thank you so much for the time.